Stand with me, please, as we read from the Word of God. I'm reading in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? Father, as we come to your word, as always, we thank you for the message that it holds. We pray that you will... By your spirit, make it very clear to us that, Father, far more than that, cause us to be obedient. We thank you, Father, for this day, Valentine's Day, Lord, a day when we celebrate love, love of family, love of spouses, love of siblings, human love. But, Lord, even as we do that, we're reminded that human love always fails in the end. Not necessarily because someone wants it to, although often because of that, but at the, if nothing else, our loved one goes before us. Our loved one is not responsive in some way to our love for them. And so, Father, we pray for all here today who have the experience of human love in whatever means, by whatever means, through family, through others, but Lord, for those who are, have been bereaved, lost loved ones recently. We pray especially for them. Lord, I think of your promise in Isaiah that you will, that you the creator, you the creator will be the husband to those who have no husband. Applied the wife to those who have no wife. How about those who have no mom or dad? Lord, the, the needs are so many. The needs go so deep. Lord, for every human, it seems like for every human glorious experience, there is a hard one. How we pray that your spirit will undertake for those hard needs. Cause that there would be not just human love, but that there would be divine love spread into the hearts of many. I want to thank you again for those children that we saw this morning and for the parents. I I just was thinking through this, and I think, I, I think I'm right that every single grandparent of those children is here, except those who have gone on, one that maybe has gone on. But we thank you for each one that has that kind of interest, and some have come from distances to be here. And so we thank you for that commitment that they have to their family, for the love that they've shown. Thank you for your grace, shown in so many ways. Think of... Little Dane, Father, is his first birthday, but last year at this time, it wasn't such a great day. We weren't sure he had to come early in order to be born on Valentine's Day, and, and uh, so it was a tough start, but we thank you for what you've done. And Lord, there are so many other areas where your help is needed. We pray for that. Pray for your grace. We all need it. We ask you for it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. If you have not already, please turn to this book of Luke, chapter 15. So we begin to consider this great and wonderful story that the Lord gives us here in this passage today. You know, in his book, um, How to Use Humor for Business Success, a man named Malcolm Kirshner reported that there are three ways to get things done. Number one is you can do it yourself. The second is you can ask someone else to do it. The third is you can ask your kids 
not to do it. <laughs> when I read that, I thought, you know, this must be how God feels a lot. It's almost like if God says, do it, we say, mm, I don't think I want to. Or if God says, don't do it, we're thinking, nah, I think that looks pretty good. It's almost like we're programmed to do whatever he says is the wrong thing, right? And in fact, we are. We are. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. That's how we're born. And if we didn't believe it, we prove it every single day of our lives thereafter. The truth is, if God had not paid the penalty for our sin by himself in the person of Christ, we would have no hope. But that's what this parable is about. It's about that hope. But there's a great twist in this parable. It's a major twist. It turns out that we can not only, not only do we go astray by breaking the law of God, we also go astray sometimes by keeping the law. We sin by keeping the law. You say, that's impossible. That couldn't possibly be true. But hang with me. Not necessarily just today, in the weeks to come. I think I can show you that that is true. There are two kinds of sinners here. We can fall into either camp easily, and many of us do. I think this wonderful parable is so unique in many ways. Uh, it, it, it lacks an ending for one thing. We'll get to the end and we'll find out that it just kind of stops right at the climax. We're never told what really happens to the elder brother in this parable. And still, it is one of the most, if not the most, beloved parables in the whole Bible. It's also one of the most misunderstood. It is commonly called the parable of the prodigal son that really immediately leads us down a wrong path. There are two prodigal sons here, both equally prominent and both equally important to our understanding of what Jesus is trying to teach. Both of these sons are alienated from their father. Both of these sons are lost. One, is in active rebellion, and it's easy to see his problem. The other is in passive rebellion, very difficult to see, and yet equally destructive and equally bad. One of them eventually responds to the incredible, unbelievable love of the Father. The second one eventually kills his father. It's not the one that you might think. But I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of the story. We will get there. This is the third of the three parables in Luke 15 that we started to look at last week, looked at the first two. Each of these parables is showing us God's love, God's provision for sinners, and his forgiveness for repentant sinners. Please underline the word repentant. The first two parables emphasize God seeking the sinner. It's a very important concept. The Bible throughout is teaching us that salvation is of the Lord, which is the prayer that Jonah prayed in the belly of the whale when he was absolutely helpless. That's our condition outside of Christ. And if God didn't make any moves toward us, we would never make any moves toward him. And so the first two parables teach us that. But this parable is about the human responsibility, kind of the other side of the coin, if you will. It is a spectacular story. It's aimed at all of Jesus' audience here, but it is particularly aimed at the scribes and Pharisees who are in that audience. They misunderstand so much. And, and this is just one more way that Jesus is trying to invite them in. But in order to do so, he does some interesting things here. He redefines God, he redefines sin, and he redefines salvation. Perhaps we have the wrong definition, but certainly the scribes and Pharisees did. They saw God, for example, as a harsh, demanding judge who 
insisted that you keep the law and that that was the way, only way you could have any relationship with him, that you could have any, be right with him was to keep the law. God was the harsh judge, very demanding. Their self-righteousness, they, they knew they couldn't keep the law, so they redefined it in terms that they could, at least in their view, keep. And then their self-righteousness from that point on knew no bounds. But Jesus redefines God as something totally different. He redefines God not as someone who doesn't require that we keep the law, but he defines him as a God of grace and as a loving father who provides what we cannot do on our own for us. Totally different picture of God than the Pharisees would have ever had. He defines God as a loving father who forgives sinners, not on the basis of them being good, but on the basis of them being repentant. Jesus also redefines sin in this context. Sin to the Pharisees and the scribes was breaking the law, doing something wrong against the list of do's and don'ts, which in fact is one way to look at sin, but Jesus takes it to a whole different level and defines it as the breaking of a relationship. The breaking of a relationship, that's what sin is really all about. That's the heart of the matter. And even, that's why someone even striving to keep the law can actually be sinning, even as they are outwardly good. Finally, Jesus redefines salvation. It does not result from keeping the law, but it results from confessing that we can't keep the law. That's a totally different picture. And the scribes and the Pharisees did not get that, but these are some of the key messages to look for as we study this wonderful story that God gives. Now, there are three main characters in this, in this parable, all of them teaching us something different, looking at ultimate reality from a slightly different perspective, and so we'll look at all of them in detail, starting with the younger son. From the younger son, we learn four things. We learn the repulsiveness of rebellion, even though it looks good. We learn the ravishment of regret. We learn the reversal of repentance. And we learn the rapture of rejoicing. Each one of those is a critical lesson for us. We'll take the first two this morning, starting with the repulsiveness of rebellion. We think of rebellion as just a little naughtiness now and then. We've been brainwashed. You know, I was, I was, I was talking today in, the, in our class, we had a small class this morning, we were talking about salvation, and we were talking about the fact that when, when people in the Old Testament came on the Day of Atonement, to make atonement for sin, and they had to bring a lamb, they brought the lamb to the temple. I think we sometimes picture that when they brought that lamb, that, they, that the priest just took the lamb, and then the priest killed the lamb, and the sacrifice was made. It wasn't like that, beloved. When you brought your lamb to the temple on the Day of Atonement for, 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 to celebrate Passover, you killed the lamb. You slit the throat. You held the life in your hand and watched it ebb out of that body. Because why? So that God could show you vividly the awfulness of sin, the price of sin, the cost of sin. We live such grace-inspired lives, we've forgotten what sin is really like. Just a little naughtiness. Way more than that. From God's perspective. And so the repulsiveness of rebellion, verse 11, and Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. Notice from the beginning, this story is about two sons, not one. The man here represents God. The two sons represent two rebels, one in active rebellion, the second one in passive rebellion. The older brother is the passive rebel representing the scribes and Pharisees. The end of them is left open in the parable, and that's kind of the setup. But the obvious sinner here, when we look at this morning, is the younger brother. He's the one who is in overt rebellion. He is the one who is the one who is outward with regard to his, well, hatred for his father at this point in time. His rebellion is very clear. 
And it's characterized in three ways in this passage, and I want us to see those. And as, as we look at these, I want you to keep your mind open, because many of you are thinking, well, open rebellion, overt rebellion, uh, somebody that's just very outward about this. This is the one who is the, the, uh, the, the active rebel. That's not me. I love God. I would not do this. But I want you to do this. I want you to look deep into your heart this morning as we go through these. You may find that some of the characteristics that are here that characterize this open rebellion of this young son is part of who you are. The fact is, it's part of who we all are, whether we're saved and we're believers or whether we're not. It's part of the reason that confession needs to be part of our daily existence in our life with Christ. So how do we characterize this open rebellion? Well, number one is self-centered. Self-centered. Verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It was anything but. This was very complex. You see, the property of this father would have been in land. So he could have, if he wanted to, divided the land and given some of this to one of his sons, but the fact is he owed them nothing until he died. If he divided the land, he could do that, but by the law of the time, he still was the manager of that land. So even though he might title one of his sons to have some of this land, it still was under his management. It was only when he died that the land would have actually come into the full control of the son. And in the case of the law in Israel, the older son would have received a double portion of the land. So the younger son, in this case, since there were two of them, the older son would have gotten two-thirds, the younger son would have gotten one-third. But the younger son is saying, I want mine and I want it now. And he doesn't just want the land, he wants the money. What that means, this is, this is an absolutely, we have to understand because we don't get this, this is a shameful request. This, is a, this absolutely shamed his family that he would make a request like this. The only way the father could accede to this request would have been to sell land at a discounted price, of course, because somebody would know he's got to sell it. And he would be shamed, the father would be shamed, the sons would be shamed, everybody in the family would be shamed. This young man is asking for this. Typically, if this should happen, and what the scribes and Pharisees thought should happen is that the father would have owned him right then and there. They said, you want what? Let me show you the back of my hand. This home is no longer your home. You are no longer my son. No inheritance is coming to you. Your demand is not only denied, but your possible future is at risk. You're out of here. That's what they would have expected. And in the times in which they lived, that's what would have been expected to, shame, to, to save the name of the family. But not this father. This father accedes to the request of the son. And he makes the simple statement Jesus does that he divided the property between them, but everybody who heard the parable would have understood what that would have meant. The boy could care less about the shame of the family. He was only concerned about himself. Like thousands before and thousands after, he wanted to be his own boss. He wanted to be his own man. He was sick and tired of being at home and hearing mom and dad say, do this, do that. Go out to the back 40 and plow the ground. Get the cows in and make sure they're milked. Butcher these so we can take them to market. He wanted nothing to do with the instruction of his parents anymore. He was done with it. He saw the, only the negatives. Of, I mean, he had it good, right? But all he could see was the negatives. Somebody else was running his life. Kipling defined the prodigal son, this young son, this way. My father glooms and advises me. My brother sulks and despises me. My mother catechizes me till I want to go out and swear. That's about as bad as it could get in those times. But that's how he looked at life. He felt like he was being put upon. He wanted his independence. He wanted a way out. He wanted no more obeying parental authority, parental orders, or anybody's orders. He wanted to be captain of his own soul. Listen, his actions here are tantamount to saying to his father, I wish you were dead. 
That's what he's saying in essence. He's like so many today who can't wait to leave home so they don't have to go to church anymore. So they don't have to listen to whatever parental guidelines and controls they are so they can do whatever they want to with their phone. So they can go wherever they want to. So they can drink whatever they want to. They just want to be in control. But listen, beloved, it's not just kids. This is the adult who still wants to run their own life, posing the father. What's being represented here is the attitude that says, I don't care about God's rules. I know what's best for my life. Yeah, I, I, I take the, the rules that he lays out for society. Those are good. We should, we should have those. We need laws so somebody can't run over somebody. But my personal life, that's mine. And some of the rules that God gives, frankly, are, are old-fashioned. They don't fit the 21st century. So I will make my own rules. I will dictate my own terms in my business, in my sexual, in my personal life. God has no business there. I will be my own person. It's the attitude expressed by one of the young songwriters, Pierce Pettis. He says it like this. He said, when I grow up, I'll look out for me. It's a small lifeboat, and baby, it's a great big sea. And your tears are nothing. Don't put all that guilt on me. That's the world in which we live. That's the outward rebellion that sometimes becomes very much a part of us, even as a believer. Outward rebels willingly pit their will against God's. They willingly redefine God's law to be whatever they want it to be, whatever fits their lifestyle. God's existence has absolutely no impact on their daily life. The heart of sin is selfishness, isn't it? Self-centeredness characterizes rebellion and it's one of the reasons that it's so repulsive to God. And you know what? It's not because God hates us. It's not because God wants us to do exactly what he wants because he just wants, because he's a control freak. God wants us to do what he commands because he knows that is absolutely the best for us in the long run. He knows that. Our disobedience is just a self-centered way of saying, I don't care about God. God can go fly a kite as far as I'm concerned. We wouldn't say that outwardly, but, but, but it, by our sin and by our lifestyle, that's exactly what we're saying. Secondly, this man's rebellion, this young boy's rebellion is characterized by shadiness. Shadiness. He's going to hide. Rebellion always denies accountability. Something... You know, but, but we can't really do that because something deep inside us always says, no, you really are accountable. So look at verse 13. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey into a far country. Notice they gathered all that he had, all that he had, all that he'd gotten from dad. He took it all. And away he went to a far country. Why a far country? Because he's hiding. This isn't difficult. Right? He wants to go out where he can do whatever he wants and nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to tell him it's wrong. He's going to be on his own. He's hiding. He's doing what exactly everybody does who is living a lifestyle that's not pleasing to the Lord. We hide. From Adam on, we hide. We cover up because we know it's wrong but we do it anyway. What's amazing to me is we, even as believers, we can sort of, if nobody else is looking, if nobody in my family, if my husband or wife or my mom or my dad or my parents or, you know, or my children, nobody's seeing what I'm doing, then I can get away with it. It's sort of okay. I don't know. I, somehow we, we sort of forget, oh, well, well, that's right. God sees everything. <laughs> the thing we learned when we were kindergarten, we forget. We forget that it's not just God seeing. You know what God, God tells us? The church is manifesting the marvelous glory of God to all of creation, to the good and bad angels, and I take it potentially to others who are in heaven. You think they don't know what's going on? Read Revelation 4 and 5. They know what's going on. You're not hiding. You're not hiding from anybody. But we think we are. God's, God's law is written in our heart. It says, 
We know we can't, but we still do it. Romans 2.15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts where their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or else excuse them. We rationalize, we make up stories, but deep down we know it's wrong. Listen, (laughs) why does most of what we consider the worst kind of sin, why does it happen at night under the cover of darkness? Did you ever ask yourself that? It's just hiding. It's another way of saying I can cover up. Deep down we know that God knows, but we can somehow just put that aside. It's an act of rebellion, beloved. It's saying I wish God was dead. Isaiah pictures it this way. He says, ah, this is Isaiah 29, 15. Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who said, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the things that are made should say to its maker, he did not make me, or the things formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding. Listen, what Isaiah is saying is this. He's saying, fool, you are so foolish. You're trying to live as though God didn't exist or as though God doesn't matter. Good luck with that. Good luck with that because God does exist and God does matter. So good luck with that. You're not hiding from anybody. God knows what's going on. The Bible couldn't be more clear on that. The Bible's ongoing message is summarized. Hebrews 9.27 is appointed under man once to die and after that the judgment. Romans 14.12 reminds us that we will all give account. Shadiness. Just fooling ourselves. And you know what? You don't have to go to a far country to do this. You don't even have to do it in the dark. You know where the, farther, you know where the farthest country is? It's right in your own heart. Father's country is in your own heart. This was Jesus' point when he said, it's not a question of, it's not a question of who did you kill today? The question is, who did you hate today? It's not a question of who did you take vengeance against? It's a question of who are you holding an ongoing grudge against and bitterness against and who do you hate? It's not a question of what did you steal today? It's a question of what did you covet? It's not a question of who did you commit adultery with today. It's a question of who did you lust after? The far country is in our own heart, beloved. And that's why we always have to remember that, you know, that key verse in the Bible, man looks on outward appearance, but God looks where? On the heart. He knows who we are from the inside out. The only person that boy fooled by running away was himself. Just like everybody who is in rebellion in one way or another against God. We only fool ourselves. Third thing that characterized his rebellion, short-sightedness. Rebellion is always short-sighted. Sin is always short-sighted. The things that we do that take us astray, they're always short-sighted. Look at verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. The word squander there literally means to scatter. So he took this inheritance and rather keep it in one place, he just scattered it everywhere. Here, there, and everywhere. Everywhere he went, scattering his inheritance. And then you look at the word reckless. It's a really interesting word. It comes from the word to save. The Greek word for save is sozo, but this particular word puts an a on the front of it, which negates it, right? So this is asozo living. This is, this is anti-saving living, wasteful living. So he's scattering his inheritance about in a wasteful fashion, an unsaving fashion, an unredemptive fashion. He's just, he's just spending it as fast as he can get it. Verse 30 implies that there may have been prostitutes involved. So I think we could read into this. This guy's the life of every party that he goes to while the money lasted. But the day came when the money was gone and he wasn't. The money left, but he lived on. 
He was short-sighted. He'd given no thought to the future. Now the future had, ar had arrived. What a waste, right? What a waste. He'd had plenty to have kept him all his life, but here he is. Now, okay, we're a righteous group of people sitting here today, right? We do things right. And so we're sitting here, and here's our response. Oh, yeah, get that guy. I mean, he's throwing his money around. I mean, he should be brought up short. But listen carefully. There's more than one way to waste your life, right? And our self-righteous response is, yeah, that fool throwing his money around like that, we would never do that. We're careful with our money. We save it up. We have it for a rainy day. We're not wasteful. We're not out there just throwing it here, there, and everywhere. But listen, beloved, do you understand that if you hoard every nickel that you have and you die never having made any investment in eternity, do you understand that you're just as wasteful as that young man was? Do you, do you get that? You're the fool of Luke 12. The one that kept all of his stuff. Remember him? He saved it up against his retirement so he could eat, drink, and be merry the last five years of his life. In fact, he had so much he was going to build more barns to put it in. What did God say to him? Fool. He's the only person in the Bible that God calls a fool. You fool. You've saved it up, but this night your soul is required, so who's going to get what you saved up? It's the same issue. The money is gone, but the person lives on. Only in this case, he's living on in eternity. And so the point of all of this is that if we are saving our money up, not investing it in the Lord's work and in eternity and what the Lord wants to do, we're just as foolish as the young man who threw it away. In God's eyes, this man who saved it up was just as guilty you see why? Because he's just as guilty as the, as the kid who partied it away because both were in rebellion against God's command to lay up treasure in heaven. Both were equally short-sighted. What God gives me, you see, is not my own. Even my life is not my own. God reminds us of that. First Corinthians 6, you, don't you realize you've been bought with a price? I own you if you really belong to me you're really my son or daughter, and certainly that means that everything in our hands is put there for his glory, not for our consumption. As we said last week, that doesn't mean we should not enjoy what God has given us. First Timothy 6.10, God has given us all things to enjoy, but he has not given it to us to consume against our own lust. He's given it to us to make somebody else's life easier. And I'm in rebellion if I'm not paying attention to that. There's a great story that uh, Clifton Fadiman, Clifton Fadiman is a kind of a, was a 20th century writer. He wrote a lot of different kind of stuff, but he had lunch one day with Arthur Rubinstein, the Polish, the great Polish pianist. And Rubinstein arrived late, and he was very apologetic when he got there. He said, I'm, I'm so sorry I'm late. He said, I've been at the attorney's office. He said, I've been making a will. And then here's how Fadiman quotes him. He said, it's frustrating. One figures, one schemes, one arranges, and in the end, what? It's impossible to leave anything for yourself. Welcome to reality, right? He's right. You can't leave anything for yourself. He's discovered what many never discover. You're going to leave it all behind. Unless. You send it on ahead. We need to invest in eternity, beloved. Anything less, anything less. And I, yeah, that's, that's not just our money. It's our lives. It's our time. It's how we invest anything that God puts in our hands. Is it, is it really going to the Lord's service? Our career. Your career is not yours to just enjoy and have for your own satisfaction. It's intended in some way to represent God on earth. It's intended as a means to allow you to invest in eternity. And my question is, are you doing that? Or is it just a means to get money that you spend on your own consumption? In that case, it's, short, it's not only short-sighted, it's, it's an indication of rebellion. 
So we have the repulsiveness of rebellion. How about the ravishment of regret? The ravishment of regret. Because when our life is not centered around the Lord, when He is kind of meaningless to us on a daily basis, we give Him Sunday, well, a couple hours on Sunday, but the rest of the time is ours. The rest of the time is mine to do with the way whatever I want to do with it. When we do that, there's an accountability. Payday is coming. Now, I know when you're young, it's hard to understand that. The older you get, when you get to be my age, you're beginning to think, oh yeah, payday's coming. And you know what? It may not be very long. And then you get sick, and all of a sudden it's really dawn on you, okay, payday is coming. Are you preparing? Because payday is coming. Look at verse 14. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. He sent him into the fields to feed the pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. Commentators aren't exactly sure what those pods are, but every description you get is that they were just something that was uh, very unappetizing to a human. <laughs> so whatever they were wasn't going to be great food, and yet this boy is so desperate that he wants whatever the pigs are eating. But nobody gave him anything. In other words, that was all he had, whatever he could get in the pig pen. Everybody loved him while he was scattering his inheritance. Everybody was his friend. Everybody was wanting to be part of the party, but now the money is gone and so are the friends and nobody gave him anything. He's hit rock bottom. And whether we hit rock bottom in this life or whether we hit rock bottom when we stand face to face with our Lord and Savior, if he is our Lord and Savior, or whether we stand face to face with God as judge, the time will come. When the, when the accounting will come. It's there for all of us. None of us will escape that. He's hit rock bottom. So he hired himself out. The word hired here means literally to glue together or to cling to. It's a very descriptive word. It, it reminds us that he left his father where the work was reasonable and where the, where the pay was fantastic and where he got whatever he wanted and had whatever he needed. But now all of a sudden he's absolutely, and, and he didn't want that. He left that, but now he's clinging to, he's hanging on to this one guy, the only guy that he can find that will give him any kind of work. He clings to him. He's desperate for it. He disdained God's work, but now he's feeding pigs. Feeding pigs, you have to understand, was the, the lowest rung on the ladder for a Jewish boy, right? This was work that he, sh he knew he should not be doing. It was work that was considered absolutely wrong for a Jewish person to be involved in because pigs were unclean animals. And now his residence is the pig pen. That's where he lives. And not only that, but he, he is so desperate he longs to eat what they, what they eat. Bitter regret. This, man, this young man has learned the hard way what the Bible tells us that well, rebellion is fun at first, the pleasures of sin are fleeting, according to Hebrews 11:25. It's really true. The little naughtiness that we think is going to spice life up is going to turn out to be fleeting. Here one minute, gone the next. But the consequences keep right on ticking. The fun is over, but the payment goes on. You see, sin promises freedom but it delivers slavery. Sin promises success, but it brings failure. Sin promises fun, but it, in the end it delivers destruction. Sin promises life, but it delivers death. The wages of sin is death. And sooner or later, it all leads to the same place. We just have a hard time believing that. Now I'm sure once again, we're all thinking, well, that's him, not me. I'm not gonna arrive at that place. But listen carefully, beloved. Any life lived without Christ at the center of it, any existence that more or less ignores him, if you could say honestly that you could go home this week and if God didn't exist, it wouldn't make any difference to your existence, then something is wrong. There's a, there's a rebellion going on that you haven't even recognized at this point because you were created and I was created to bring glory to God. According to Isaiah 
43, 6, and 7. That's our purpose in life. And if we're living as though Jesus didn't matter, if we're living as though God didn't matter, we're driving at something that can never bring lasting happiness or success or contentment. We, 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 so many of us kind of, you know, we kind of trade the journey in. It's kind of like we think, well, okay, I, if I just get, if I just get, and you, you put in whatever it is, if I just get that person, if I just get this thing, if I just had this career, if I just had this much money, if it's, that, that's what we're aiming for. And the emptiness, we're, we're experiencing our any empty, inner emptiness is, is kind of experienced as a drive to get something more. And what we have to look at is to understand that that's really a sense of spiritual thirst that's going on in our life is to see those who have gotten everything there is to get. They tell us the story. Solomon, who had more than any person probably in our experience, including Warren Buffett and Donald Trump and whoever else you want to mention, because he did get to be president, right? Solomon had it all. He said, what did he say? He said, it's all vanity. And he went on in the book of Ecclesiastes and he named every one of them. I don't care whether it's position, money, whatever it is, sex. 700 wives, 300 concubines. That's a woman a night, every, you know, every night for three years running, a different one. He, if, he knew about this. You know, it, what's his name that runs that magazine? Had nothing on him, right? It's vanity. That's not the answer. In second place, those things can be wonderful. In first place, they are horrible. That's why Boris Becker said this. He said, I had one Wimbledon. He's a tennis player. I'm assuming, assuming too much. Some of you don't know he's a tennis player, right? He was a great tennis player 20 years ago. He said, I had one Wimbledon, the Wimbledon tennis tournament, twice. Once as the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the possessions I needed. It's an old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide. They have everything and yet they are so unhappy. I had no inner peace. How can you not be at peace when you have all of that stuff? Os Guinness says we, we live in a world where we, have, where we have too much to live with and too little to live for. There's a problem when we're not looking beyond just here and now. There always will be. You say, well, I'd rather have Becker's problems than mine. But, beloved, you're, you're, not, you're misunderstanding. He has your problems. He thought the same thing you think. If I just get enough sex, fame, and money, and, 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 and position, and recognition, it's all going to be great. And he did what you probably haven't done. He got all of that. He said, I still had no inner peace. Sophia Loren famously in an interview not long ago said she had everything. She had awards. For years she struggled to get a family. She finally got her family. She got married. She got success. She got movie stardom. And she said this. She said, in my life there's an emptiness that is impossible to fulfill. You know, when I hear that, I want to ask, well, if that's true in this life, what's it going to be like? in eternity. <clears throat> What's it going to be like to have been in rebellion against the Lord until the grave comes? That's why Jesus describes hell as weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think the worst part, I, the worst part of hell is going to be the unremitting eternal ravishment of regret. <laughs> if I had only. Too late. It's this life now that drives eternity. So perhaps you're saying this morning, well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm, I may not be highly religious, but I am I'm basically good. I'm morally upright. That's all that should matter, right? I'm a good person. Let me ask you this. Suppose you had a guy whose mother had to raise this child alone. She didn't have much money, but she pours her life into this child. She raises him. She puts him through school. She manages to get him a good education. She says, son, I want you to have a good life. 
And here's my advice to you. My advice to you is to tell the truth, to work hard, and to care for those who are poor. I want you to do all those things. And so the son grows up, he gets the education, he goes off. He gets a great job, he begins to live his life, gets a career, but he never ever speaks to his mother ever again. Sends her a card on her birthday and that's it. What would you think? You go ask him, you're, all you're doing, you just, you're not, look, look at your mother's sacrifice, look what she did for you. And what's he going to answer? He's going to say, well, I'm, I'm morally upright. I live a good life. I tell the truth. I work hard. And I give to the poor. What else matters? How is his mother going to feel about that response? You see, we're, it's easy for us to see from a human perspective that that response is totally inadequate, right? It's not the moral goodness. It's the relationship that counts. It's all God is saying here, beloved. You can be as morally good, as morally upright as you want. I want you. If I don't have you, the rest of it is meaningless. I want the relationship. The greatest rebellion of all is to reject the Lord and Savior who has given everything that he has so that we can have everything that he has, if we'll accept it. But to rebel against that is the worst crime we can commit. Don't do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. What a reminder that you're in charge and we're not. But that's not for our detriment, Father. It's for our ultimate good. It's so that we can have what we cannot have any other way. Whatever the world promises, whatever the life that we think we're going to carve out for ourselves without your involvement, whatever we think that's going to be, it will, never, it will never bring the contentment and the happiness and the joy and the eternal satisfaction that knowing you brings. And so, Lord, whether we sit here this morning, today, in open rebellion, we're, we're just those who have never accepted you as Savior, really have no interest, don't want to know about God, don't believe any of this bunk, whether that's our situation, in which case, Lord, we just pray that you'll do a work in those hearts and draw them to yourself. But perhaps it's those of us who are believers who are living this way, even though we have truly come to you. But over time, we have sort of begun to ignore the disciplines of a godly life. We've let them become unimportant. We are basically living a life of rebellion. Now, Lord, the first question would be whether we are really a believer because your word is pretty clear. We could not live as a true believer very long in that condition. But if we have for some time been that way, would you please help us, Lord, to turn our life to you? Give it to you. And Lord, in the words of the song we're about to sing, that you would change our heart. Those who are, have never come to you in faith, those who need today to say yes to you, help them to do that. Those who have been playing at this, playing at church, playing at Christian life, Lord, we need the same thing, that you would change our heart to follow you completely. Guide us as we make the decisions you ask us to make. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.